Hey there, Bourbon Real Talk listeners and watchers. I have a very appropriate piece of content for you today because it is whiskey hunting season. So for those of you who are not in the whiskey world very much, maybe you're just a casual drinker, uh, you may not know this, but there is a whiskey hunting season. And there are certain bourbons that are really hard to get a hold of. Um, some of the more popular ones that you maybe have heard of would be anything from the Van Winkle line, anything from the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection. There's several other producers that have special releases. And all of those come out at the end of the year, what they call OND, October, November, December. And most of those come out between the last week of November and say the second week of December, but it's different in each area of the country, but that's what it is here in Texas where I'm at. And everybody wants to always know, how do you get your hands on these highly sought after, hard to find bottles? Well, first off, you need to understand that the only way for you to get this stuff at retail is to find a retailer who has the bottle and is willing to sell it to you. And a lot of people don't understand that the retailer that, you know, these bottles can cause a problem for them, right? I mean, you, you, you would think like, hey, it's just a product. They're in this business to make money. So I just go in and I buy it. What people don't understand is this represents a really small portion of the revenue that that retail store has to generate every year just to stay in business. And so while this may be the biggest deal in the world to you, it's not the biggest deal in the world to them and they actually spend a much higher percentage of their staff's time dealing with customers coming in asking for these rare bottles, then it's probably worth to them in terms of profit because the store is typically only operating off of a 25% profit margin. They may only get, I don't know, a small retail store, three to five of these bottles per year. And they might make, a, I don't know, 20, 30, $40 per bottle. I mean, you're talking about $200 worth of gross profit to them per year. It's really a huge hassle. Uh, most of the stores would love to just order more because they've got plenty of customers that want to buy it. But the bottom line is, is there's just not enough. And we could have discussions for days about why the producers haven't caught up with demand. But the long and short of it is most of these bourbons that people want to get a hold of, they take between six and 18 years to make, some 20 and 23 years. So you'd need a time machine to have been able to predict how much you needed to make back then. So, you know, we do have a supply and a demand issue. Now, these retail stores, they don't want to lose customers. And the way that they handle these bottles can actually create a problem for them. Because if they have a loyal customer that's coming in regularly getting shelf products that the store can order plenty of, they want to keep that customer happy. But if that customer says, hey, part of the reason why I'm coming here is because I, you know, I want you to get me a bottle of uh, Van Winkle or, or I want you to get me a George T. Stagg at the end of the year, now all of a sudden the store has a problem because they may lose the repeat business of that customer. And if they sell that bottle to one customer over another and the customer that didn't get the bottle finds out, that can screw up their relationships. And so this is a huge problem. Some stores have even started turning down their allocated bottle because they just don't want to deal with it. Um, and some stores have gone the opposite direction and they're fighting with the wholesaler to try and get their hands on more product like this. And some of the times they're asked to like jump through a lot of hoops to be able to get access to these rare bottles. And while it's not always 100% legal what they're asked to do, at the end of the day, the wholesaler has to figure out a way to decide who's going to get the bottles and who's not. And often, they give the bottles to their best customers. And how do you become their best customer? Well, you may take on more of a, a product than you probably wanted to. Uh, maybe it's a vodka, maybe it's Fireball, maybe it's whatever. Um, but you may take on product that you maybe weren't going to just to keep the wholesaler happy. So they'll give you these special products. So let's just keep in mind before we start interacting with a retailer, trying to get them to sell these bottles, what they had to go through to get to them and what, what the risks are for them and handling these bottles wrong. And I think that's going to help you maintain the right attitude and give you a better opportunity to get in there and keep that retail store happy. So they want to do business with you. So the stores do control who buys. And in my survey of the land, and I've been all over the country hunting for these rare bourbons, I've kind of categorized stores into several different categories of how they decide who they're going to sell to. 
So one way that they do it is to their best customers. Some stores have some sort of a, you gotta enter your phone number when you're ringing up or you've got one of those little cards that they scan and they keep track of your sales volume and then they give the bottles to the customers that spend the most money. And if that's the case for that store, that may not be a store that you wanna approach because you may have to spend tens of thousands of dollars before you even get your name in the hat. Um, I like this because from a business perspective, it makes sense, you're encouraging the behavior that the store wants, but I don't like it because often the customers that spend the most money are not the people that are gonna appreciate the bourbon the most. So you may have somebody who's a wine collector that gets to buy Pappy Van Winkle every year because they spend so much money on wine. Another way that retail stores do it is through a raffle. And this is an interesting way to evenly distribute the bottles. So sometimes they have a raffle sign up. Sometimes when you buy certain bottles that they're trying to push at the store, they'll give you a little, a little ticket that you write your name on and you drop it in a bucket. And at some point they're gonna draw and I recommend that you get into as many raffles as you can, How, whatever the rules are, follow the rules, because that's a really easy way to win. And when you win, you just get a phone call and bada bing, bada boom, you got a bottle. So that's awesome. Um, some stores do what they call first come, first serve. And that can get kind of interesting depending on how they put their, their bottles out. There have been a number of stores, and I've been to a couple, that when they get their allocation, they collect it all up and they release it all at once on a Saturday morning, typically. And they tell everybody, hey, Saturday morning when we open up at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, whenever they open, every single thing we have, it's going to be here on the table and it's going to be first come, first serve. Now, this can be kind of interesting because it creates a fun opportunity. It, it doesn't sound fun because this is always in the winter. So it's going to be cold, possibly rainy, but there's this practice of camping outside of a first come first serve liquor store to be one of the first ones in line to get in there and to get your bottle. And even though that sounds insane, you end up making some really good friendships whenever you do that. So as you go around to liquor stores and you find out how they do their distribution, if you find one that does a, you know, one day drop, first come, first serve, I recommend you go camp out. You know, everybody, it creates kind of some, some camaraderie. People start going to the store and buying donuts for each other and everyone's drinking coffee and sharing whiskey, even though you're probably not supposed to drink outside of a liquor store, but it happens because it's the middle of the night, people trying to stay warm and it's a whole lot of fun. But the best way to come across allocated bottles is to find a store that distributes based on customer relationship. And that is a scenario where anybody, regardless of how much money you have, how much time you have, you can change your buying behavior to become a known person in that store and drastically increase your odds that you're going to get some um, allocated bottles every year. So how do you form a relationship so that you are kind of top of mind and you can take advantage of a relationship-based store? Well, one of the things that I recommend people do is you need to be consistent. So you need to probably pick a store when you find one that has relationship-based selling, you probably should redirect most if not all of your alcohol purchases to that, that chain or that store. Um, what does that look like? Well, like my wife, my wife, she, she drinks wine and I had been in the habit of buying her wine at the grocery store when it was on sale, but now I redirect those purchases to retail partners that I'm trying to maintain a relationship with so that they'll, you know, remember me and they'll want to re reward my good purchasing behavior. Um, you know, vodkas, uh, gins, rums, whatever it is that you're buying just for mixers, try to get it at that one retail lo location. And then also you wanna consistently um, be seen in that store picking up just your regular daily drinkers. Now, one thing that I've observed whenever I've been in a store and I've seen people come in looking for allocated bottles is that often they'll, they'll end up in like this confrontational style of communication with the store uh, employees. And you have to understand, these employees are asked a hundred times a day, do you have any Blantons? Do you have any Blantons? Do you have any Blantons? And they're like, I just don't have time to deal with this. So they're frustrated. And if you come in and you don't have a very, you know, approachable, genial personality while you're dealing with them, they're just not going to want to help you. And so you want to be consistent and come in often. You want to buy, you know, everything that you can from them, but you want to be kind, right? Um, and you want to make yourself known. You don't want to be a quiet person that comes in, grabs your bottle, rings up, never says anything to anybody. 
you need to learn how to kind of strike up a conversation. And, and every time you go in, you want to say hi to the person whose job it is to decide who gets the allocated bottles so that they see you consistently and you start to, you know, be top of mind aware for them whenever they're thinking about their bourbons. Um, and you want to be engaging the decision maker and finding out if they also, uh, they also drink whiskey, right? Uh, because that can be a very handy uh, piece of information. And one of the things that I try to tell people to do is that when you go to approach, especially a new store, and you're getting to know who the players are and how they do their drops and all that stuff, don't engage in the conversation without a bottle of whiskey in your hand, okay? Go to their shelf, find a shelfer that you know that you, you know, is one of your daily drinkers, and have one in your hand when you walk up to talk with the people because they want to see that. What they don't want to do is sell their bottles to a customer that's just coming in for the allocated products. They don't need your allocated product purchase because they have a thousand customers for every bottle. What they want is somebody who's going to support the store. And when they see that bottle in your hand, that helps them understand that you want to be part of their ecosystem and not just a taker. And so I like to recommend that you always have a bottle on hand um, and you need to show empathy in your statements when you're communicating with them. So I actually make specific reference to the problems that they deal with when I'm getting to know a new store manager. And I say, look, man, I get it. I'm in the whiskey community. I know that you have a tough job. I get that a lot of people are coming in here just to buy bottles because they want to flip them and make a profit. And I'm sure that's frustrating for you. But, you know, I'm, I'm a person who drinks whiskey and I open everything. Um, and, and so if you ever had anything allocated that you were able to get to me, and I know you probably have other customers that you've got to take care of first, but if I ever show up on your list, just know it's going to go to a good home. It's going to get opened and I'm going to share it with a lot of people because most of my allocated bottles, I don't even drink those by myself, right? I only get those out when people come over to the house and they're looking to have a, you know, special experience. And so if you get me one of these bottles, actually, not only is it going to get drank, but it's going to get shared and it's going to get tasted by probably 50 to hundred people, you know, de de depending on how special the bottle is. And I feel like that the people that are making these decisions, they, uh, they appreciate that. You know, they like, they like knowing that the bottle's not just gonna be flipped, you know, but regardless of what happens in any of these conversations, never leave the store empty handed, okay? You need to walk out with something, even if you just buy a bottle of tequila for the next time you're gonna be making margaritas, you need to always have something in hand whenever you're walking out. Um, and then one of the other newer techniques that I've been using is when I'm in the store, you know, we got to communicate to the store that we understand their plight and that we're trying to help them achieve their objectives, not just our own objective of getting the whiskey that we want. So, you know, I've always got vodka, tequila, rum, you know, other spirits in my house, mostly for mixing. And I really don't care what the brand is because once it's mixed, I'm not going to be able to tell the difference. And so I've gotten to the habit of asking the store when I'm talking with the manager, I say, hey, I know that some of your products you have higher margins on than others, and I really don't care what brand I buy. So I wanna help the store out. What tequila could I get that has a higher profit margin for you? And often you'll see a shocked look on their face that, that you would even care about helping them with their profitability because they're so used to interacting with people who just come across as selfish and you know, are only looking out for themselves. Um, if you find out that the decision maker is also a whiskey drinker, every single time you go into the store, walk in with the sample and give that sample bottle uh, to that individual and try and give them some pretty good whiskey. Because if you've got some good bottles at home already and you're giving out samples, you will set yourself apart. That individual will know, hey, this is a person that really opens these bottles, drinks them, shares them. And, um, you know, when you ingratiate yourself to people, I mean, there's a psychological effect that happens when people take something from you, um, especially if it's something that they consume into their body. I don't know, it feels like it kind of makes a connection and it makes them want to interact with you even more. Um, one of the things that I do, especially if it's a new retail store that I'm just getting to know, is if they ever do offer me a bottle, one, I take it, okay? Even if it's something that I already have at home or it's something that I wasn't super excited about. Maybe it's like an Eagle Rare, which to them, maybe it's a bigger deal, but to you, 
you might already have a couple bottles at home, um, I take it. The other thing I do, and this is very important to prove to them that you're not a flipper, is that I offer to open the bottle at the store and let them taste it. Now, this is not legal everywhere, so some stores may flat, you know, refuse this op opportunity. Um, and you may have to do some special stuff with your bottle while you're driving it home to make sure you're not violating any open container laws in the state that you live in. But this is something that I've offered, and it seems to have a pretty good impact on the decision maker because they can tell that obviously if I'm opening the bottle, I'm not going to flip it. And I'm showing my generosity back to that individual and saying, hey, do you want to taste it? And I feel like this has helped me get bottles that I wasn't going to get before because now they know they, they and, and I also invite them over to my house. If the store is local, I, sometimes I'll show them some pictures of, of some of the bottles that I have in my collection and I'll say, hey, if you ever want to come over and just do a tasting, I would love to have you over, right? And so by offering to open up the bottle and drink it with them there and then offering to have them come over to the house and taste your whiskey with you, now all of a sudden in the back of their head, if a bottle of whiskey comes in that they want but they're not allowed to buy it themselves, they kind of know that they can sell it to you and drink as much as they want. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and it costs them nothing. Because many of these stores, the managers are prohibited from buying the allocated items because the store owners and upper management are afraid that if word got out on the street that these bottles that these customers so desperately were seeking after were just getting gobbled up by the employees that work there, they would lose repeat business. And so many stores have a prohibition on these, um, these decision makers from being able to buy these bottles. So when you give them samples and you offer to open it and you open up your house to these individuals to come and taste this stuff, you're creating a workaround for them to be able to get the things that they wish they could get as well. Um, and, and in instances where the store doesn't want you to um, you know, open the bottle for them or maybe they're not a drinker, some of the time, the store manager or the decision maker will give you their cell phone number. I make a habit that when I get home, um, I open up the bottle, I take a picture of the bottle open, and then I text it to the decision maker. Again, just showing that individual that I'm drinking this whiskey, and then I'm sharing this whiskey, and so on and so forth. Um, so those are pretty much the entirety of the techniques that I use. Um, now let's talk about some things that you should probably avoid. So one thing is, is you need to figure out pretty quick whether or not the store that you're engaging is a gouging store. Because we've talked about this in some of the other podcasts, but retailers set their own pricing. They're independent businesses and they are immune from, from uh, persecution from the producer. If the producer doesn't like what they're doing with their pricing, there's nothing that the producer or the wholesaler can do about it. So I would avoid stores that price gouge. However, if you ever do go into a store because you're on the hunt and you're looking for a new store and they have the bottles that you want but the prices just aren't right, negotiate. I mean, what do you got to lose? And I've heard some success stories where, you know, maybe it's a bottle that's, you know, normally $120 and it's selling on the secondary for $450 and you can get them to take $250. It's double what they should have made, but it's way less than what you would have paid on the secondary. So don't be afraid to negotiate if you go into a gouging store. Um, and, and those conversations can be a little bit tense, but if they're a gouger, you're not going to buy there consistently anyway. So, you know, go for broke. Uh, the next thing to do is, or to avoid would be don't call a store and ask them if they have any allocated bourbons in stock. This is very annoying for the store. It, it takes them away from whatever it was that they were focused on. And the reality is, is no store is ever going to tell you that the answer is yes. They want to reserve those bottles for the customers that are coming in and supporting their main objective of being a successful, profitable business. And people that are only going to come in if you give them the allocated bottle they already have multiple customers for, they don't want that. Uh, so don't even bother calling to ask. Um, Another thing is make sure you don't engage in any argumentative conversations, right? You have to have tons of empathy and compassion for these decision makers and keep that in mind when you're interacting with them. Because I've gone into a store before and the manager, whatever, was having a bad day. Maybe an employee called in sick. In one instance, I knew where an employee had fallen off a ladder and the manager was worried because they were worried about getting sued and all this stuff. Sometimes they're having a rough day. And you got to understand, you might be the hundredth person that came in that day asking these types of questions. 
And so try to make sure that you're conversational. But if they get rude and short with you, don't get rude and short back. Just say, hey, man, totally understand. Sound like you're busy today. Um, I'm going to go grab a shelfer and uh, maybe I'll catch you next time I come in and just jam out, right? Uh, Another thing to avoid is anything that could give that person the impression that you're only there to get allocated bottles, okay? Or anything that could give that person the impression that you're going to sell the bottle or not open the bottle or trade the bottle, Um, Now, there are some stores out there that have kind of a first come, first serve, and there's a large retailer here in town, and one of the things that they will do is you can kind of learn what distributors um, bring product to the store on what days, and people will start to line up outside of the store, and that can be a very good, you know, way to do it. If you've got time to get out there and you know about what time the delivery trucks come, I've had some people have success with that. But anyway, that's generally how I build relationships. That's how I get a hold of the allocated bourbons. I hope this content was helpful for you. I know that there's a lot of new whiskey enthusiasts out there that really want to get their hands on some good bottles. And if you follow these practices, you may not have success all the time, but you're going to have enough successes that it's going to be fun and you're going to have good stuff to share with your friends. So if you'd like more information about Bourbon Real Talk, you can reach us at bourbonrealtalk.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. I would love it if you would subscribe, like, review, and comment on your favorite podcast player as well as YouTube. Even if you're not going to consume the content all the time, it helps the algorithm so that more people find the content. And As always, if you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you, and I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. This content is being brought to you by the Bourbon Real Talk American Whiskey Aroma Kit. This is a tool that I put together to help all you whiskey aficionados out there develop your palates. You can sit down with the vials and train your senses, or you can sit down with a great dram and break that whiskey down to its components. If you have any interest in purchasing a kit of your own, head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick one up. Thank you for listening.